Father in heaven, we thank you for the awesome opportunity of gathering together this morning to reach the climax of this summit. We felt your presence. We've been overjoyed in the fellowship that we've uh, encountered with one another. It's just been a wonderful experience. Now we must go from the mountaintop down to the valleys. And we must uh, face strife and opposition. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that you will help us to be bold and at the same time be kind and loving in sharing these things that we've studied, these very important things. We ask that you will bless our study this morning, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to enlighten our minds, to open our hearts. And uh, we just ask, Lord, that you will be present through the ministry of your holy angels. And Father, we thank you for the privilege of prayer and for knowing that uh, you will keep your promise to be with us because we pray in faith and we do it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go to page 11 of our material, page 11. And just let me give you a little bit of a review on the basis of what we've studied previously. Uh, Ellen White speaks about a threefold union, as does Malachi Martin. And we found that this threefold alliance is papists, Protestants, and worldlings, or what we referred to as the secular. That includes the rulers of the world, the kings of the world, the presidents of the world, as well as the unchurched, the secular. And we notice that this group particularly is the target group of the papacy now. We also notice that the Pope has embraced three main themes that resonate with this particular group, with the worldings. Number one, the environment. Number two, family. Now he hasn't, the Pope hasn't addressed overtly whether the family is male and female or male and male and female and female. He's just emphasizing the family without emphasizing the, the heterosexual aspect. And then number three, the importance of uh, supplying the needs of the poor. And we notice also that he placed all of the other social issues like euthanasia and abortion and same-sex marriage, he's put those on the back burner because his purpose is to win over the politicians of the world, the secular of the world, the secular media and so on that don't identify with the, with the conservative social agenda. Um, and then we also noticed in our study that God gives the reason why we should care for the environment, why we should emphasize the importance of the family structure, and why we should care for the poor. And the reason is creation. We should care for the environment because God made it and it's His. We should care about the family structure because God on the sixth day created the family male and female, and told them to be fruitful and multiply, to form families. We should also care for the poor because they were created by God. So the reason why we should emphasize these three themes, which it's, there's nothing wrong with the Pope emphasizing these three themes, except for the motivation for doing it that he has, is creation. But we notice that creation took place in six days, and then God established the seventh day as a memorial of creation. In other words, the Sabbath reminds us that we're supposed to take care of the environment, because it's God's. The Sabbath weekly reminds us that we are supposed to care for the poor, because they were created in the image of God just like we were. The creation story, the Sabbath also tells us that we're supposed to gather together as a family structure, as a family unit to keep the Sabbath, to recognize that God should be the center of the family. In other words, God gave a weekly reminder of these three items that the Pope has emphasized in his agenda. Now we're going to notice uh, some very interesting things today about this. We also notice that the Sabbath is a sign of redemption, which is recreation, right? The Apostle Paul says those who are in Christ are a new creation. The old things passed and everything is new. So Paul said redemption is a new creation. Now which day of the week did Jesus say it is finished? 
on the sixth day. Did he finish his work on the sixth day in Genesis? Yes. yes. And then what did Jesus do on the Sabbath? He rested. He rested. By the way, if you're wondering whether the Bible says he rested, in Acts chapter 2, Jesus is speaking, he's actually uh, a quotation from the Psalms. My flesh shall also rest in hope. So the Bible says that his flesh rested in hope, in the hope of the resurrection on Sabbath. And then, of course, the followers rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So the Sabbath now becomes a sign of what? Of redemption, just like it was a sign of creation. And then we also notice that in the future, when God makes a new heavens and a new earth, what will be the sign of the Creator? It will be the Holy Sabbath. And then, as we ended our study yesterday, we noticed that the Bible has a very interesting end time scenario. The Bible tells us that the end time, this world is going to unravel at the seams. Things are going to get worse and worse and worse and worse until the only hope of the planet is the second coming of Jesus Christ in power and glory. If not, there would be no flesh left alive. That's what Jesus said. So it's not going to get better and better by solving the problems of the environment, by providing for the needs of the poor, by emphasizing the family structure. None of that is going to fix this. Things are going to get worse and worse and worse until the only hope of the world is in a glorious, literal, personal, rapid second coming of Jesus Christ in power and glory. And then this world will be without form and void for a thousand years. And then after the thousand years, God will create a new heavens and a new earth where we will live with Him forever. That is the biblical scenario. Now let's go to the bottom of page 11. Are we all caught up? Yes. Now let's go to the bottom of page 11. And let's study the papacy's view of beginnings. And then we're going to study their view of endings because their view of endings is in harmony with their view of beginnings. See, if we believe that God created this world in seven days and it was rapid and it was supernatural, well, you can believe that the end is going to be rapid and supernatural. But if you believe the beginning was not rapid and supernatural, you have to believe the same about the end time. Now, let's take a look at this. The papacy's view of beginnings is radically different. According to recent popes, primarily after Pope Pius XII, who ruled from 1939 to 1958, he's the infamous pope of the Nazi regime. Yes. We won't get into that. By the way, before him, most Roman Catholic scholars taught that creation was literal. But after that, recent popes began teaching that life on earth came into existence by a big bang, and then evolved over the course of millions of years. According to this view, at some point in the evolutionary process, God gave a well-developed simian a human soul, and this marked the beginning of the evolutionary development of Homo sapiens. Roman Catholic popes and theologians, primarily after the time of Jesuit paleontologist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, Frenchman, Jesuit, he is the guilty one that changed the Roman Catholic view from creation to evolution. He's a contemporary of Pope Pius XII. By the way, a fascinating book that I'm reading now, it's called The Jesuits by Malachi Martin. Do you know that the Roman Catholic Church is going through the same type of struggle that we're going through right now? Malachi Martin was a very conservative Jesuit, extremely conservative. He wanted to go to before Vatican II. Uh, you know, Vatican II allowed now to say the Mass in English and, you know, gave the Roman Catholic Church a facelift, so to speak. Didn't change its nature, but gave it a facelift. But Malachi Martin, in, in this book, shows how the Jesuits 
have liberalized the Roman Catholic Church to make it palatable with worldlings. It's a fascinating, it's a long book, it's about 500 pages long. It really gives you a bird's eye view. There's, a, there's, there's three or four chapters just on the Ignatius Loyola, which are really eye-opening, the spiritual exercises and so on. But anyway, let's get back here to this. Once again, Roman Catholic popes and theologians, primarily after the time of Jesuit paleontologist Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, teach that the story of creation cannot be taken literally. It is a symbolic myth. Thus the Pope, in his encyclical, refers to the language in the creation story as a symbolic narrative. In the papacy's view, God used evolution as the mechanism to bring into existence what we see today in the world. Now listen, Pope John Paul II, and this is before the present Pope, Pope John Paul II, in a speech to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences in 1996, had already referred to evolution as more than a theory. And now I quote John Paul II. Today, almost half a century after the publication of the encyclical Humanae Generis of Pope Pius XII, 1950, new knowledge has led to the recognition of the theory of evolution as more than a hypothesis. He's saying that evolution is more than just a hypothesis. It is indeed remarkable that this theory has been progressively accepted by researchers following a series of discoveries in various fields of knowledge. The convergence, he's talking about the convergence of the studies of all these sciences, the convergence neither sought nor fabricated of the results of the work that was conducted independently is in itself a significant argument in favor of the theory. So what he's saying is that biology and, uh, and uh, chemistry and all of these sciences, they have studied you know, the origin of life and they've all reached the same conclusion that the world came into existence through the mechanism of evolution. In typical Jesuit fashion, Pope Francis I has also attempted to reconcile the creation story with the evolutionary, evolutionary theory by synthesizing them. Thesis and antithesis synthesis. Hegel's philosophy, which we've already heard about from other speakers. In this way, he has attempted to please both theologians and naturalist scientists. Have your cake and eat it too, in other words. The secular he wants to please and the religious. In his own words, now I'm quoting Pope Francis I, the Big Bang, which today we hold to be the origin of the world, does not contradict the intervention of the divine creator, but rather requires it. Evolution is in nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation because evolution requires the creation of beings that evolve. Are you seeing how he's trying to please both? When we read about creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God was a magician with a magic wand able to do everything. But that is not so. So no, he's saying God can't speak and have things come into existence. He created human beings and then let them develop according to the internal laws that he gave to each one so they would reach their fulfillment. In other words, God created humanity through the process of evolution. God was involved, yes, but he used evolution as his method. The purpose is to please theologians who believe in God and to please the secular who believe in evolution. That is the Jesuit way. Now what the Pope fails to describe, and this is important in his statements, is the cruel and disgusting mechanism of evolution. Scientist Frank Lewis Marsh, Seventh-day Adventist, explained it this way. Evolution presents a bloody, ruthless struggle 
for existence from the very beginning, where there is much waste of living substance and many false starts and blind alleys. It's a method, of, in other words, of trial and error. The process of evolution functions on the basis of natural selection or the survival of the fittest. The strong survive and the weak pass away until all the errors of the evolutionary process are ironed out. Does this sound like a wise creator? Is this the God who cares for the sparrow? Dresses the lilies of the field in their beauty and has the hairs of our heads numbered? This method of trial and error with suffering and death is a direct attack against the omnipotence of God and His wisdom. Are the power and the wisdom of God so limited that He could not get things right the first time, but rather had to use a method of false starts to weed out the imperfections in the course of hundreds of millions or even billions of years? Evolution also strikes directly against God's love and, and goodness. How could a God of love witness the cruel suffering of His creation over millions of years, even before sin entered the universe? What authority, by the way, would God have to tell us to be kind to the ecosystem and the lower life forms and the less fortunate if He Himself showed such a crass disregard for them in the supposed evolutionary process. Are you understanding me? The Bible describes a literal and unbroken chain of events. If one link is broken, the entire chain falls apart. Now let's take a look at what that chain is. Number one, Adam and Eve were literal persons whom God created perfect and placed in the literal Garden of Eden, just like Genesis says. You agree with that? Did they have any taint of sin? No. No tendency, no propensity, just like Lucifer in heaven before he sinned. Perfect natures. Second, Adam and Eve were literally tempted by a literal serpent and had a literal fall into sin. Agreed? Once the virus of sin came in, it infected every literal descendant of Adam and Eve. So far so good? And what came in as a result to all men? Death came in upon all men as a consequence of sin. Let me ask you, is death a consequence of sin? So could death have existed before sin? No. And number five, this is the most important. Because of sin and death, humanity needs a Redeemer who will make it possible to bring the world back to its original perfect condition where there is no sin and no death. Amen. If you get the beginning wrong, you don't need a Redeemer. Are you with me? Think about it. If there was death in the world long before sin, then the link between sin and death and redemption is broken. Death would not come in as a result of sin. Thus the link between creation and redemption is broken because the purpose of redemption in the Bible is deliverance from death. Roman Catholic theologian, interesting, Carl Schmitz Mormon was brutally honest when he wrote about the link between a literal fall into sin followed by death and making necessary redemption from sin and death. By the way, he's a very liberal Roman Catholic theologian. Notice what he says. The notion of the traditional view of redemption as reconciliation and ransom from the consequences of Adam's fall is nonsense. For anyone who knows about the evolutionary background to human existence in the modern world. Are you understanding what this man is saying? He's saying that it's ridiculous to believe that redemption is what? 
The redemption is reconciliation and ransom from the consequences of Adam's sin because he doesn't believe in the story of Adam and Eve's sin. Further, he states that because in his view the story of Genesis is not literal, salvation cannot mean returning to an original state but must be conceived as perfecting through the process of evolution. Is that the Seventh-day Adventist view? By the way, do you know something? All of these views of the emergent church that are starting to enter, enter the Seventh-day Adventist church are based on the theory of evolution. Those who are propounding them, they might still say today, we believe in creation, you know, and they, they might think in their minds that they can reconcile creation with pantheism, but ultimately they will lose their view of the Creator God because that happened with Kellogg. The target of the devil is creation and the Sabbath and ultimately redemption. That's why Ellen White says that these views will sweep away the whole Christian economy. There will be no Christianity left if these views are embraced. This is serious what we're talking. You know, we didn't just choose this theme at this summit because we thought that it would be a nice thing and it would attract a lot of people. We're serious about this. At stake is the existence of our church. Do you think it's important that we speak about these things? We can't stay quiet. Now let's continue. Excuse my zeal. <laughs> I love, this is my church. I love this church. We can't let this church go down the tubes. I'd rather fight than switch. <laughs> Some of the old timers will remember that. <laughs> the question that begs to be asked is this. In this scenario, how much longer must creation wait before the process of evolution reaches its omega point, to use the words of Chardon? Will it take millions of years? Billions? How many millions or billions of years must we wait for lambs and wild beasts to live together in harmony? and for wars to cease? How much longer must creation cry out in pain for its deliverance? The evolutionary scenario certainly doesn't offer us much hope for an imminent coming of Jesus to quickly make all things new. Because where are we in the process of evolution? There still might be millions of years for the mistakes to be ironed out. Will cha change take place over vast periods of time? Or will it be in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump? Clearly, our view of how things began will certainly impact our view of how things will end. Now let's talk about evolution and the Sabbath. It has become common for Roman Catholic theologians and some evangelical and Adventist ones as well. To refer to the stories of Genesis 1 through 11 as non historical legends. What would happen with the Sabbath if the story of creation did not literally take place just as Genesis describes it? The answer is inescapable. If the days of creation were not literal 24 hour days, then the seventh day was not either. And the Sabbath, as a perpetual memorial of a loving, wise, omnipotent creator, evaporates. The target of the devil is the Sabbath, folks. Actually, Francis' concept of beginnings is incongruous, in other words, it doesn't fit with his expressed desire to address climate change, family values, and the plight of the poor. Why should we respect creation if it has evolved over millions of years and is still in the process of evolving? If by a process of natural selection or the survival of the fittest, the strong survive and the weak disappear, why should we help the underdog? Why should the haves be concerned about those who have not? Is it not the mechanism of evolution that the strong thrive and the weak disappear? Only when we realize that all persons are God's creatures, created originally and literally in the image of God, Will we feel the desire to care for them and provide for their needs? 
Further, if the creation story did not literally take place, how can we argue that families should have a father and a mother rather than two fathers and two mothers? See, the target of the devil in getting rid of creation is getting rid of heterosexual marriage. Because if the story of creation didn't take place as it's in the Bible, then you cannot say that God established the Sabbath or heterosexual marriage. Those are the targets of the devil, the two creation institutions. The papacy claims that climate change is caused by human activity and must be resolved by mere human methods such as conservation, recycling, eliminating fossil fuels, and international laws and treaties adopted in response to the moral voice of the Roman Catholic papacy. We know that one of those international laws will eventually be mandatory Sunday rest. This law will presumably give a rest to the environment, provide family time for worship, help people connect with their spiritual roots, and give the poor a rest from the endless capitalist cycle of work. This in turn will supposedly bring in the long expected millennium of peace and prosperity under the moral leadership of the papacy guiding the civil powers of the world. Thus, in this misguided scenario, the planet will have reached the ending point of the grand design. Are you catching the picture? Now, we've studied the Roman Catholic view of beginnings. Let's see if their view of the end squares with their view of beginnings. Can we expect, continuing here, a rapid supernatural end to human history with an evolutionary model? Impossible. If the original creation was not supernatural, rapid, literal, and perfect. Could we expect that when God creates a new heavens and a new earth, it will be so? The papacy's view of the end is compromised by its view of the beginnings. How many more millions of years must we wait for the process of evolution to work out its quirks, wrinkles, and flaws? For Roman Catholic theologians and popes, the blessed hope of the church is not found in the second coming of Jesus. The goal is for the papacy to take over the kingdoms of this world by joining church and state in order to establish a theocratic kingdom where the church will control and provide moral guidance for the state. I ask, how many times did you hear John Paul II refer to the second coming as the great hope of the church? None. How many times have you heard Pope Francis say that the second coming is the great hope of the church? None. Because that is not the hope of the Roman Catholic Church. That is not the eschatology of the Roman Catholic Church. The eschatology of the Roman Catholic Church is through the moral guidance of the papacy, combined with all of the nations of the world, in this case it would be the United Nations, they're going to establish a theocracy like the one that existed during the 1260 years. And there will be a millennium of peace. Have you heard that quite quotation from Ellen White about them, this bringing in the millennium, the long expected millennium? The reform scholar Harold Robbins, in his book Ecclesiastical Megalomania, page 187, expressed he's a Presbyterian, he's a reform scholar, he's not Seventh day Adventist, but he knows what the papacy is up to. He says, what the Roman Catholic Church state accomplished on a small scale during the Middle Ages is what it desires to achieve on a global scale in the coming millennium. Praise the Lord that we still have some people outside the Adventist Church who get the picture. There's nothing new under the sun. This theocratic, now listen carefully, this theocratic experience, experiment has been tried once before during the 1260 years. And this happened in Europe. And what happened? It failed miserably. Bringing about misery, disease, suffering, poverty, civil war, squalor, strife, and martyrdom that eventually culminated in the explosion of the French Revolution. What makes us think that the papacy will do any better on a global scale? Since the times of St. Augustine, 
The Roman Catholic Church has taught that the stone that hits the feet of the image of Daniel 2 is, does not represent the second coming of Jesus. The Roman Catholic Church doesn't believe that the stone is the second coming of Christ. What do they believe? It rather represents the papacy taking over the reins of the secular powers of the world to establish Christ's universal kingdom of peace on earth. It is a sobering fact that on the Mount of Temptation, Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and he rejected them. But Satan offered the papacy those same kingdoms and the papacy accepted the offer. That's why the papacy is the vice regent of Satan. And I know that's a strong expression, but it's true. What is the papacy's ultimate goal in all of this discussion on climate change, family values, and helping the poor? Now we get to a very important point in this discussion. We can tell by the catchwords and expressions the papacy has used to address these issues. The key words, now listen carefully, and expressions that appear repeatedly are the common good. And in parentheses I have the explanation, individualism is an enemy to be dreaded. Solidarity. We are all in this together, so we must all unite in one ecumenical body. As he says in his, in his encyclical, we require a new and universal solidarity. Another word is subsidiarity. That means that, that simply means our personal interests are subsidiary to the common good. And finally, the common destination of goods you will find. It means that property is not personal but belongs to all of humanity according to need. Are you catching the picture? Time and again, popes, conciliar documents and theologians have used these words and expressions. I have about 10 pages of them, but I'm all, I only included two in this document. Let's take a look at a few of them. Pope Benedict XVI in 2009 in his encyclical Caritas in Veritate made this chilling suggestion. There is an urgent need of a true world political authority as my predecessor, Blessed John 23, indicated some years ago. Such an authority would need to be regulated by law to observe consist consistently the principles of subsidiarity and solidarity, to seek to establish the what? The common good, and to make a commitment to securing authentic, integral human development inspired by the values of charity and truth, caritas in veritate. Furthermore, such, now here comes the scary part, furthermore, such an authority would need to be universally recognized and to be vested with the effective power to ensure security for all, regard for justice, and respect for rights. And I'll give you one guess who that universally recognized power would be. Something similar through the United Nations. Something similar is stated in the Compendium of Catholic Social Doctrine. By the way, this is a document. I have it on my desk. It's this thick, literally. The Social Doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church. It makes fa I haven't read the whole thing, but it makes fascinating reading. And this is just one statement, and I have many others as well. If it is true that everyone is born with the right to use the goods of the earth, it is likewise true that in order to ensure that this right is exercised in an equitable and orderly fashion, regulated interventions are necessary. Interventions that are the result of national and international agreements and a juridical order that adjudicates and specifies the exercise of this right. Basically what he's saying is that private property, there's no such thing as private property. If a government wants to confiscate and expropriate something that belongs to someone to give it to the poor, it's perfectly acceptable. This has happened in Venezuela. 
it's, it's, it's the government stealing from people. But it's the idea, it's this idea that there need to be national and international agreements and a juridical order, that is an enforcement agency, that adjudicates and specifies the exercise of this right. In other words, it's not really a right. The government decides. Now, the question is, which war world political authority was Pope Benedict referring to? Well, Pope Pius XI, in his encyclical Quadragesimo Anno, had already provided the answer. Listen carefully. The principle which Leo XIII so clearly established must be laid down at the outset here, namely, that there resides in us, that is in the papacy, the right and duty to pronounce with supreme authority upon social and economic matters. Are you catching the picture? The papacy's end time scenario is radically different than the biblical one. As we have previously seen, the Bible portrays a pessimistic end time scenario. The earth will grow old. There will be earthquakes, famines, pestilence, social unrest, and wars that will lead to a tribulation such as never has been seen. The abomination of desolation, a universal Sunday law, will be set up and God's people will be hated and persecuted by all nations. Toward the end of the great tribulation, the seven last plagues will decimate the earth and the second coming of Jesus will reduce the planet to the way it was in before creation week. Dark, empty, disorderly, and uninhabitable. The angels will then gather, God's, gather up God's elect, elect and take them to heaven for a thousand years, after which God will create a new heavens and a new earth. That's the biblical scenario. In contrast, the papacy sees a potentially brilliant future for the planet under its moral leadership. In its view, human ingenuity and international laws will be able to solve the planet's problems. And the kingdom of God will be established on earth with the papacy serving as the moral voice for the nations of the world. Thus Pope Francis in his speech to the United Nations stated this. Notice how it's centered in human beings' laws and taking care of the environment and providing for the poor. This is what he said, among other things, human genius, well applied, will surely help to meet the grave challenges of ecological deterioration and of exclusion of the poor. So what's the solution for the problems of the poor and for the ecosystem? Human genius. The papacy believes that this theocracy will bring about the long expected millennium of peace. By the way, that's what Protestants also believe. And that's also what the secular people will come to believe. The papacy believes that this is going to happen and that prosperity will come as a result. You see, for the papacy, this world is our permanent home. An idea that contradicts the Bible, of course. According to Scripture, we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. The heavenly city is our home. Amen. Our citizenship is in heaven from where we expect Jesus and His second coming. Is it any coincidence that the wicked in Revelation are portrayed as the earth dwellers <laughs> which are glued to this planet? The Pope has linked these three causes to captivate the world. Climate change, poverty, and family. And here comes a very important point. He has linked all three with Sunday sacredness. This is not a Seventh-day Adventist imposition. He has said this. According to the Pope, Capitalism has enslaved the poor and deprived them of necessary rest and therefore international governments should draw up laws that would pressure private enterprise to give them a Sunday rest. It reminds me of the Dodge Ram advertisement that Alan mentioned yesterday. By the way, this has already been done in the Pope's native Argentina. And there is great pressure to do the same in the European Union. Are you aware of the fact that the papacy and the uh, labor unions and the churches in Europe are pressuring the European Parliament to uh, give Sunday off, to close all of the businesses on Sunday so that people can go back to church? Because only 6% of the French attend Mass on a regular basis. 
So the way to solve that problem is to make a law that closes everything down and then they'll go to church. Boy, that's a good motivation. The Pope has further argued that capitalist countries have spoiled the environment. So notice his first argument has to do with, uh, you know, the capitalist system, you know, we need to give Sunday rest to the poor. The Pope has further argued that the capitalist countries have spoiled the environment and the poor countries have suffered as a result, and therefore the rich nations should financially compensate the poor ones. And the Pope has indicated that Sunday is a magnificent way to let the environment rest by stopping the exploitation of nature for one day in seven. He has further stated that capitalism treats human beings like machines and deprives them of the opportunity to gather with their families for Sunday Mass and spiritual enrichment. So all three of these are connected with Sunday. One, the poor, give them a Sunday rest, you capitalists. Family. Oh, you know, because they're so busy and all the time, you know, they don't have time to go to church. So let families rest on Sunday. The environment, well, the environment needs one day to rest. Bottom of page 16. As a biblical foundation for this Save the Planet crusade, <laughs> the Pope appeals, this is so ironic, he appeals in his encyclical to the pattern of the seven-day weekly cycle, the seven-year sabbatical cycle, and the 49-year cycle of the Jubilee. But here's the interesting point. This is all fine and dandy, except for the fact that in all these cycles it was the seventh in the sequence, not the first when the people were to rest. Amen. The debts of the poor were to be forgiven. In other words, you're supposed to care for those who are in need. The captives were to be released, and the fields were to be left fallow on the seventh, not the first, in all these cycles. The Bible clearly indicates that the seventh day Sabbath is the day to let the environment rest. The day for work to cease so that man can spend time with God and with family. A day to give the poor a break from the rat race of work. The Pope's idea is great, but he has the wrong day. On August 19, 2015, at his weekly general audience, Pope Francis spoke about the need for days of rest, especially Sunday celebrations of Mass, and time with the family because they are important reminders that every human being is made in the image and likeness of God and is not a slave to work. Last I knew it was the Sabbath that the Bible says signifies that. Even a superficial reader of the Genesis story will discern a serious disconnect between the Pope's counsel and the creation story. How can the Pope appeal for Sunday rest based on the creation story when the story clearly states that the seventh day Sabbath is the commemorative day of rest, not the first? I mean, are not people intelligent enough to, to understand this? And now it gets worse. On what authority could Pope John Paul II boldly state in paragraph 14 of his pastoral letter, Dies Domini, that Sunday should be kept because God blessed it and made it holy? Listen to what he said. Sunday is the day of rest, I'm quoting him now, because it is the day blessed by God and made holy by Him, set apart from the other days to be among all of them the Lord's day. Now, what chapter and verse is that in? That's, in That's just an open, bold face, face lie. Amen. It's nowhere to be found in Scripture. According to Francis in a radio address on August 12, 2015, said this, The obsession with economic profit and technical efficiency puts the human rhythms of life at risk. Moments of rest, especially on Sunday, are sacred because in them we find God. Last I knew, the Bible says it's Sabbath. Do you understand now why Sabbath and Sunday is going to be the issue in the end time? See, what Ellen White said, we're seeing it before our eyes. The Sunday Eucharist 
brings to our celebrations every grace of Jesus Christ, His presence, His love, and His sacrifice, His forming us into a community, and His way of being with us. The Sunday Eucharist. See, the Sunday and the Mass are connected. But there's a problem with his argument. There is no evidence in Scripture that Jesus established the Sunday Eucharist. <laughs> Jesus did establish the Lord's Supper, but it was on a Thursday evening. If Jesus intended his followers to celebrate the Eucharist on Sunday, why did he institute the Lord's Supper on Thursday evening? Jesus certainly did not celebrate it with his disciples on Resurrection Sunday because he had already told them on Thursday evening that he would not drink the cup again with them until he entered the kingdom. So he didn't celebrate the Eucharist on Sunday with his disciples. If Jesus had wanted his disciples to celebrate the Eucharist on Sunday, he could have celebrated it with his disciples on Sunday night. After all, his blood had been shed and his body had been broken. But, Jesus, but what Jesus ate was part of a honeycomb and a portion of a broiled fish. <laughs> See, all of these arguments are totally anti-biblical. But the people in the world are ignorant of the Bible, so they, they swallow the whole thing. Hook, line, sinker, fishing pole, fisherman, boat. And in a somewhat pantheistic conclusion, you need to read the conclusion to his encyclical. You know, I would encourage you, read the whole thing. It's long. It's about 130-some pages, 237, I think, paragraphs. It's divided in paragraphs. In a somewhat pantheistic conclusion, wow, it's scary what he says there at the end. You can see why he would exalt Thomas Merton uh, as one of the four heroes when he gave his speech. Uh, heroes of, from the United States in his speech before Congress. Francis ends his encyclical by appealing to the Mass, to Sunday, to the Trinity, that needs to be revisited, and the intercession of Mary. Intercession of Mary. Yep. There is much truth in the encyclical, but it is laced with error. I mean, the, are the causes bad? Is it bad to emphasize family? Is it bad to care for the environment? No. Is it bad to care for the poor? No. Good causes. Wrong motivation. If you drink 100,000 parts of water mixed with one part of cyanide, it will kill you. A great degree of truce laced with a slender part of error can be spiritually deadly. Now let's go to the next section, a deceptive system. Why are so many clergymen and politicians in the Christian world wondering after the papal system? The reason is that they have chosen to cast aside the lurid history of the papacy, either because of ignorance or because they think that the system has changed. Many claim that the papacy of today is not the same papacy of the past. Even Adventists are writing these things. It, you know, in, in Adventists today and in Spectrum you find... You know, sometimes I wonder whether they're really Adventists by what they publish. Yeah. Yeah. They're certainly not Seventh-day Adventists in the sense that we understand a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, in the sense that Ellen White presents Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. You know, they write, this papacy has changed. But in this they ignore the fact that the papacy itself claims that it does not change. Its motto is semper idem, always the same. But the simple fact is that the papacy cannot any more change its fundamental nature than a person can change his DNA. Persons may change their external appearance by putting a lot of makeup and their earrings and all those things, but their DNA remains the same. Likewise, the papacy may give itself a facelift, but underneath the change of appearance is the same DNA. Ellen White has well described the deceptive nature of the papacy in the Great Controversy, page 571, when she said, The papacy is just what prophecy declared that she would be the apostasy of the latter times. And now is the best description of the papacy I've ever found, especially Jesuits. It is a part of her policy to assume the character which will best accomplish her purpose. 
but beneath the variable appearance of the chameleon, she conceals the invariable venom of the serpent. A chameleon is a lizard. I lived in Latin America. Many of you have been uh, were from tropical countries. A chameleon is a lizard that is able to change colors depending on the environment where it is found. In this way, it is able to camouflage itself from its potential enemies. But despite the change in external color, a chameleon is a chameleon still. This is the way in which the papacy operates. On the surface, it appears innocuous and charitable, but by its very nature, when it ascends to power, it is despotic, totalitarian, and rules with an iron fist. And that's what people don't realize. And Ellen White says, the United States is playing around the snare. And once the United States is caught in the snare, it will not be able to escape. It'll be too late. Many have pointed out that the Jesuit Pope Francis I has exhibited great love for the destitute and outcast of society. He washes the feet of prisoners, lives in humble quarters, drives an old beat-up car, lays hands on children, hugs lepers, refuses to judge gays, speaks about love and peace, and fights for the preservation of the environment. Above all, he defends the rights of the poor. This has led most of the world to have a positive image of the Roman Catholic system, hasn't it? It is striking that what Francis does is quite similar to what Jesus did while he was on the earth. Did Jesus bless the children, lay his hands on the children, and embrace the poor, and refuse to judge the, those who were sinners uh, in, the, in the view, in the eyes of the righteous people of that day and age? Absolutely. So it's striking that Francis uh, does, what he does is quite similar to what Jesus did while he was on earth. This has led many to conclude that he is the representative of Christ on earth. But it is really a masterful counterfeit. He who claims to be vicarious filidae, it's that means one who claims to occupy the place of Jesus Christ. Amen. Or vicarius Christi, that means vicar of Christ. The one who claims to occupy the place of Jesus on earth is actually the man of sin who sits in the temple of God, that is the church claiming that he is God. And here's something, it is sobering to realize that Judas Iscariot also manifested a seeming interest in the poor. And Judas, who is called the son of perdition, wanted a temporal earthly kingdom and had his own colleagues fooled until the very end. I have a two-hour presentation on the man of sin. It hasn't been edited yet, but it's going to be edited. That prophecy of 2 Thessalonians 2 is powerful. Is it any surprise that the papacy is presently able to deceive almost the entire world? Is it any coincidence that 2 Thessalonians 2 refers to the papacy with the same name as Judas, the son of perdition? There must be a connection in their characters because the name represents characters. So if Judas is called the son of perdition and the papacy is called the son of perdition, there must be many similarities. And remember that Francis I is a member of the Jesuit order. Regarding their mode of operation, Ellen White explains. Now this is a description of what Francis I looks like today. When appearing as members of their order, they wore a garb of sanctity, visiting prisons. Has that happened recently with Francis? Yes. And hospitals. Mm -hmm. Ministering to the sick and the poor. Mm -hmm. Professing to have renounced the world. And bearing the sacred name of Jesus who went about doing good. But under this blameless exterior, the chameleon aspect, folks, the most criminal and deadly purposes were often what? were often concealed. You know, there's, there's not a lot of overt references to Sunday. You know, some people say, well, is there a national Sunday law in Congress? No. Because the Sunday movement does, is not overt at first. It's covert at first. Notice this statement from Ellen White. The Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue. 
And many who unite in the movement do not, the, do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. Did you notice the term? It's making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing. People don't see what's happening in the undercurrent. Its professions are what? Mildly, mild, and apparently Christian. But when it shall speak, it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. Now, we're almost finished here. We'll come to a very important part. In the context of what I've written, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a special relevance for this time. Our very name was providentially chosen for a time such as this. Think of it. Our very name points us to a supernatural beginning and a supernatural end. Creation in seven literal days and the second coming of Jesus Christ. The three angels' message has the same beginning and ending point. The first angel's message commands the entire world to worship the Creator. And this directs our attention to the literal seven-day beginning. And immediately after the third message, Jesus is seen sitting on a cloud and coming to the earth, pointing us to the second coming. Thus the three angels' message just begin with creation and they end with the second coming. Just like the name, Seventh-day Adventist. Well, the first angel's message commands us to worship the Creator the third, warns us not to worship the beast. Do you see the contrast? First angel says, worship the Creator, keep the Sabbath. Now, if the Sabbath is the sign of the Creator, then the beast has his mark too. So what, the, what must the mark of the beast be, or the sign of the beast? It must be the day that he has changed. Thus, worshiping the Creator and worshiping the beast are opposites. If the Sabbath is the sign of the true Creator, then the beast must have us a day that is a counterfeit sign. Ellen White has correct, was correct when she wrote this. No name which we can take will be appropriate, but that which accords with our profession and expresses our faith and marks us as a peculiar people. The name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world, and I would say to the Catholic world as well. Here is the line of distinction between the worshipers of God and those who worship the beast and receive his mark. And then she says, the people need to be aroused to resist the advances of this most dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. You know, when we were going to go to this Philadelphia project, we had emails from people saying, you know, should you really do that? You know, should, you're going to make people angry. You know, this is the Pope's moment. You know, I, I received it. This is the Pope's moment. Don't spoil his party, is basically what they're saying. Folks, if now is not the time, I don't know when the time is going to be. And Ellen White says we need to warn people about this dangerous foe to civil and religious liberty. While we have freedom of speech, it's going to be a lot more difficult later. There is no other church in the world, folks, that claims that their mission is to reach the world with the three angels' message. There's no other church that says this is our mission and this is our message. God knew that the remnant church needed to have a name that would distinguish it from the apostate triumvirate. Our very name is a witness and a rebuke to Catholicism, Protestantism, and worldlings and stands in contrast to their view of the beginning and of the end. So where does Secrets Unsealed fit in? From its very inception, Secrets Unsealed has committed itself to preaching the three angels' message. We believe that our God-given duty is to call the world to worship the Creator and to shun the beast, his image, and his mark. Pure and simple, this is the reason why we exist. Ellen White has written concerning the reason for our existence as a church, and I quote, There is no other work of so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Other than preaching these three messages. That's why we exist. If we're not doing this, we have no reason to exist. God has not called us 
so that our main mission is to, is to build mega churches. You know, the reason why people flock to mega churches is because, is because the message that is, presented, that is presented is palatable to their wishes. As we have traveled to different places, many have expressed appreciation that we have kept the Three Angels logo on our exhibition booth, on our letterhead, our newsletter, and our fundraising letters. And it will continue to be so. Recently, someone asked me somewhat sarcastically, if Secrets Unsealed is all about the Three Angels' message, why did you waste three years on the women's ordination issue? That's what they said. Now listen. My answer was swift. The first angel's message calls us to worship the Creator and to return to His original Genesis plan. The Genesis plan includes the Sabbath, marriage, diet, and the roles that God assigned to men and women in the home and in the church. Amen. And the first angel calls us to worship the Creator. That must mean restoring the roles. Not much. In fact, Paul himself directs us back to creation when he refers to the roles of men and women in the home and in the church. Furthermore, the relationship of the Father and the Son in the Godhead is reflected in the relationship between Adam and Eve at creation. <laughs> I read this statement, Great Controversy 581. God's word has given warning of the impending danger. Let this be unheeded, and the Protestant world will learn what the purposes of Rome really are, only when it is too late to escape the snare. They're fooling around at the, at the, at the opening of the snare right now. They don't know that they're playing with fire. We need to tell them. Finally, let's look at some flaws as we summarize some flaws in, uh, I'm just going to deal this with this one last section, then you can read the true motivations part, because there's something that I want to say before we come to an end. What are some of the flaws of, of the arguments of Francis in his encyclical? Number one, how can Pope Francis encourage us to care for God's created order when he does not even believe that the creation story is literal? Is that a valid point? Yes. Second, even if the Pope believed in a literal seven-day creation week, which he does not, he has chosen the wrong day to commemorate it. Amen. The Bible is unambiguously clear that the day to allow the created order to rest is on the seventh-day Sabbath, not on Sunday. Third, the motivation behind Francis's call for his reforms is open to question. It seems like the ultimate objective of his climate change, family, poverty, crusade is global control. So the causes are good, but the motivation behind the causes is what we are concerned about. Fourth, even though climate change, family, and poverty are directly related to explosive population growth, the Pope simply brushes aside this factor because his church is opposed to birth control. In paragraph 50 of his encyclical, he reprimands those who claim that population growth is a significant factor in the crisis for world the world presently faces. He says population growth has nothing to do with poverty. Yeah, right. Like we were all born yesterday. Notice what he says. Instead of resolving the problems of the poor, and thinking of how the world can be different, some can only propose a reduction in the birth rate. Demographic growth, he says, is fully compatible with an integral and shared development. To blame population growth instead of extreme and selective consumerism on the part of some is one way of refusing to face the issues. Fifth, Pope Francis fails to address the impact of animal husbandry upon the environment. Dr. Teske can identify with this one. Some scientists esteem that more than 50% of the methane gas in the atmosphere comes from the animal dung rather than fossil fuels. Amen. 
Furthermore, animal husbandry, uh, husbandry not only defiles the air we breathe, but also the rivers and the oceans. Anybody who's from Arkansas, that's a prime example of the chicken farms that are there. Arkansas is a beautiful state, by the way. I'm not saying that you should go there. So if Francis is so concerned about God's creation plan, why not encourage everyone to become a vegan? Amen. Amen. <laughs> what good is it to tell everyone in the Vatican to turn off lights and to turn down the air conditioners and then be a voracious meat eater, as an Argentinian, by the way, that keeps the meat producers mass-producing animals that will defile the environment. Finally, Francis lacks a clear concept of how things began and how they will end. The Bible states that things will wax worse and worse and the second coming will be the only solution to the problem. The Pope, however, sees a great future for the planet under the moral leadership of the papacy. And then the final section deals with how you can really resolve these issues. The real problem, folks, is not the problems with the environment and the poor. The problem is with human selfishness. Yeah. And unless you resolve the problem of human selfishness, these other problems will never be resolved. Now, in conclusion, what can we do when we leave this place? Some practical suggestions. Number one, take the presentations that we have produced here. They will be on YouTube. Uh, they're not on YouTube now, right? We're not live streaming. We'll put them on YouTube. They'll be available to everybody. Make sure you send uh, these to as many people, the, the news about them to as many people as you can, your Facebook, email, etc. Use social media to share this, symposium, this uh, uh, summit as well as the symposiums that have been done previously on this particular issue. Second, start a study group in your home and invite people to come. By the way, don't do this secretly behind your pastor's back. Tell your pastor, you know, I'm, I want to start a study group in my home. There's, there's no reason why the, they should forbid you from doing that in your own home. Show them the, the, these videos. Other uh, faith increasing materials. Number three, pray without ceasing that the Lord will be with His church and that the Lord will make the necessary adjustments. Speak from person to person about the dangers that are facing the church. Some will listen, some won't. You know, the ones who don't listen you know, that have their minds made up. You know, Jesus said, shake the dust off your shoes and go to the next person. There will be people who will listen. Let's not keep silent. Let's speak up. Let's be nice. Let's be loving and kind. But let's be bold and clear and firm at the same time.